So you guys be seated. I know some of you are thinking, man, that was a weird, what's Jeremy doing with a handheld? If you have been here over the past few years, you know that on Mother's Day, we, um, we ask special guests to come and deliver the message. And over the past couple of years, you've seen Melanie and you've seen Jenny. And um, this year, we are tremendously blessed to have Beverly Shelton, David's wife, Micah's mom, Jacob's mom, who's going to be coming up and who's going to be leading and who's going to be teaching us this morning about worship. It's a blessing and an honor. I think especially for you guys to have the opportunity to hear from Beverly's years of wisdom and experience, not only as a mom. I mean, for kind of out loud, she puts up with all the Shelton boys all the time. Amen. That qualifies her above and beyond sainthood as far as I'm concerned. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) We are so thankful and grateful to hear your word. Thank you. Absolutely. Oh, there it is. Okay. Well, I tell you, I thought to be appropriate, the first thing I should do when I got up here was to... Thank Jeremy for asking me to do this today, but um, as he walked off, I'm kind of changing my mind. (laughs) Just a tad, just a tad. Um, I didn't realize how tall this podium is. I'm a little short up here. My apologies. I hope you can see me. Okay. Um, Today is Mother's Day. By the way, to all the moms, the grandmoms, the stepmoms, the substitute moms, the wannabe moms, the moms-to-be, happy Mother's Day. You know, men, go home, be good to these women, because I can assure you, they deserve it. So, happy Mother's Day to everybody. Um, Truthfully, I am really excited to get to talk to you guys today, because I'm going to talk about two of my passions. Um, First, worship. If you know me at all, man, I love to worship. But today being Mother's Day, I feel a little obliged and also want to talk to you about my second passion, my family. Um, But before we get started, I'm not going to lie, I can need to pray. You can probably hear it in my voice. So bow your heads and let's pray this morning. Father God, I look out and I see the faces of all the people that you love. God, and all the people that we've talked about for weeks now, the people that would be here. God, I pray today that at least one person walks away hearing you, having heard you, having felt you so much more than they do through their weeks, God, and they walk away with a renewed attitude toward worship. God, I love you, and I praise you, and I pray that you see worship in every aspect of my life every day. Amen. Uh, When you think about worship, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? For me, it was always music. I love music. Music speaks to my soul. You know, in fact, I feel pretty safe saying that most of us equate worship with the songs that we sing on a Sunday morning. In fact, our perspective of worship probably is limited to what we experience here at church, be it songs, the message, prayer, small group, communion. But scripture is really clear about what worship is and it extends far beyond the songs that we sing on a Sunday. Worship is an intimate expression of gratitude for the mercies of God. And singing is just one aspect of that. R.C. Sproul is a writer and theologian. He said, the worship to which we are called is far too important to be left to personal preferences, to whims, or to marketing strategies. It is the pleasing of God that is at the heart of worship. Therefore, our worship must be informed at every point by the word of God as we seek God's own instruction for worship that is pleasing to him. So as I started looking up scriptures that related to worship, I kept coming back to one. So it's kind of where I'm going to hang our hat today, okay? In Romans 12, Paul writes, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. So that statement again from R.C. Sproul, it is the pleasing of God that is at the heart of worship. Those of you that know David and I 
hardly any at all. We've probably told you our story. But this morning I'm gonna share just a few brief details to kind of walk you in to how I learned that worship is so much more than what we do within these walls on Sunday. I'm gonna keep our personal details hopefully brief because we are not that fascinating. But God is, so kind of hang with me, okay? David and I married in 1988. I'm the youngest of six kids, big family. So I was determined we were gonna have a big family. Um, about a year after we were married, I was pregnant. We were so excited. We went every month to the doctor, every month got a good report until that fifth month. We walked into the doctor, they checked for that little heartbeat, which was always the first thing they did. And in that fifth month, there was none. We were devastated, of course, but we moved forward, did what we do, um, and decided, okay, we'll try again. So what felt like forever, we were pregnant again with our second child. This time, at about 10 weeks, I miscarried. Um, at that point, we started talking to the doctors. This led to tests and pills and shots and temperature taking and chart keeping, and I'm not sure how they do it now, but that's how they did it in the olden days. Um, but it led to all of that, and finally, after what felt like forever, we were pregnant again, baby number three. We were cruising along. Uh, we were living the life. We just knew that third time's a charm. The doctors were cautious, but um, we were living the, living the life, waiting on this perfect little baby. Well, at 24 weeks, it was a Monday night, my water broke. David, I was at a ladies' meeting of all places, thankfully at my mother-in-law's house, so she took care of me. But um, David came and got me. We drove to the hospital. They p admitted me, and they told us there was no way the baby would survive. So we, they had put us in, and we laid in that hospital room. They had put a heart monitor, a little monitor on us, and so we were listening to that little heartbeat, come and go. And we just knew that was it and then that little heartbeat would stop back, start back up. That went on until in the middle of the night, David finally just asked him to take it off. You know, we, we knew what we were waiting, we knew what the outcome was gonna be. So um, they took the monitor off, and the rest of the night we spent sleeping very little, but praying and, you know, that God would just accept our baby and let him go home quickly. Um, the next morning, the nurses came back in they put that monitor on and that little heartbeat was still just a going. Everybody was surprised. <laughs> we were thrilled. We just knew this was gonna be it. Um, at that point, a doctor came in and offered us a little bit of hope. He said, I think we can give this baby a 50-50 chance. If you're willing to go into the hospital um, and stay, if we can keep you in here and keep the baby healthy until 32 weeks. So buddy, we were ready, we were on it. But of course, they gave us a list of all the things that could go wrong. If he's born early, cerebral palsy, blindness. We were like, you know what? God knows our future, this is our baby, we're gonna do this. So they put me in what was called Trendelenburg position. I stayed on my head to keep everything in place. And we were in for the long haul, we were ready. But after five days, one of the things that they told us could happen was infection setting in, and infection did. And they came and they took the baby at that point. The baby was born one pound, 10 ounces, um, 81 days in the hospital, one surgery, a grade four brain bleed that somehow miraculously disappeared, many other setbacks and many other victories. We brought Jacob Shelton home at four pounds, 10 ounces. <laughs> And on a heart monitor, but you would have thought we were walking out of that hospital with baby Jesus himself. We were very proud, very proud. We had a ticker tape parade. We had gotten to know all the doctors and the nurses, and so it was a big deal when we got to carry this baby home. I was gonna flash up a picture, but as my sister-in-law likes to say, at that point in time, you know, that was, what, 92? My hair was bigger than Jacob, so I'm gonna spare us all that. Um, so no, no pictures today, but we were so proud of our, what we knew to be little miracle. Um, 
And during that time that Jacob was in the hospital, God and I talked a lot with my part of that conversation sounding like, God, just give me this one baby, this one baby of my own. Just let him make it. But after we'd been home with Jacob for a couple of years, and he had done great, and all of that pain and struggle of walking that journey, we kind of started thinking, you know, maybe a second, you know. So God and I started talking about babies. We'd been talking the whole time. Please don't think we were not. But we started talking about babies again with my part of the conversation sounding like this. God, remember what I said about I wouldn't ask for another one? Well, never mind. You know, I'm back and I'm asking, maybe just let us walk this path one more time. So we went back to the doctors. The doctors said things like, your chances of getting pregnant again are slim to none. If you do get pregnant, a viable pregnancy is slim to none. If you have a viable pregnancy, the chances of you carrying full term are slim to none. So David and I had a lot to talk about. So we went home and we decided God knows our future. He had walked with us this far. We're gonna give him a chance. We're gonna give us a chance. So after what felt like forever, we were pregnant again. Child number four, we were ready to walk this path. We got to the doctor, nine weeks, I was nine weeks along, they immediately took me off my feet, they put me on bed rest, and there I stayed until I was 32 weeks, and then Micah Shelton, healthy, happy little boy, born, and we were a family of four. And why God, <laughs> thanks, but I'm telling you that, but, <laughs> Why God chose to bless us with these, what we knew to be perfect, these perfect little babies, we had no idea. But um, I'm telling you, we knew absolutely that God was in control and that he had given us these babies. From day one, when we walked home with these children, we knew they weren't ours. You know, I was one of those mothers that was like, you wanna hold my baby? He's a miracle. He's a miracle, you wanna hold my baby? We absolutely knew that these children were not ours, that we had them for a short period of time. We knew that they were gifts from God and beautiful miracles with every fiber of our being. So we counted our blessings. We knew we're a family of four and I think even God was relieved at this point. They're, they're resting, they're gonna put it at rest. But I tell you, we had no choice, and we knew this, but to give these babies back to God. And I had to do that every day to constantly remind myself, because you know, we get busy. So every day I reminded myself, they're yours, God, they're yours. So we began to pray that God would help us raise them to become who he wanted them to be not little versions of us. And if you know us, that part was very important. So um, that's what we prayed every day. And every night as I rocked them, and if you know me, I'm a crier, so I cried over them. My prayer, not this elegant prayer, but it was, God, thank you for this baby. Please don't let me mess him up. That was all I could muster at the time. But you know what, at this point in my life, this is when I began to realize that worship was so much more than what we do on Sundays. These babies that we had, that we were determined to raise the best that we could to be worshipers, to be God lovers, to know Jesus, um, they were a gift. And we knew that they were gifted to us for a short period of time. And so we wanted them to know worship. It was at this point that I began to understand parenting. For me, the way that I was gonna try to raise these boys, this was part of my worship. This was part of my way of loving God, giving back to him because he had given me so, so much. Because he had entrusted David and I with what we believed to be these two perfect little humans. We would do everything that we could to give them back. This is when I began to realize, you know, worship is so much more. So 
we became determined for our boys to see us live out our worship. We had prayed and we had prayed and we had prayed and God had answered abundantly. Why, why us, why we were blessed, we didn't know, but we would give them back. God has done so much more in our lives than this people, salvation, so much more than we could think, ask or imagine. But we're gonna get to the salvation part in just a bit. As our kids grew, David and I knew that living out our worship was important, but we came to a point in our lives where we realized we weren't exactly doing that. Oh, we were doing all the right things. We were going to church, we were going to small group, we were joining groups and leading things at church, but there was not sincerity in it. We were fulfilling an obligation. And this, people, is not what we wanted our kids to see. We needed them to see worship out of us. We needed them to know up, and we had promised that we would raise them, grow up, to know and to love Jesus. We wanted and we knew that God wanted our children to see true and authentic worship. And people, that begins right here. Having our kids in church, having your kids in church, having your grandchildren in church, you being in church, this is so important. Being here is where our kids hear from Miss Melanie about how Jesus loves them, how much he loves them, how much he forgives them, where they go when they mess up. This is where we learn where we go when we mess up. This is where we find out that we are forgiven. So having them here is important. You know, I pray every day still that our kids see David and I living out our worship. Um, and now we pray over them as we see them doing the same thing for their kids. We look at our two beautiful daughters we have because of God's miracle. We look at three beautiful, if you haven't seen them, beautiful grandbabies that we have because of that continued miracle. And so we pray that they see us doing that and can I tell you how beautiful it is to see them doing the same for their kids now. So in preparing for today, I read a statement that said, some people still think of worship as a special moment in a Christian meeting. That is a form of worship. You know, when somebody says a prayer and there's something in it that speaks to your heart, when you're a couple of songs in in the worship service and one of them just speaks directly to you, that is a form of worship. But truth be told, if we are living to love God and living for him, all of life is worship. Everything that we do should be done in the light of pleasing him. Romans 12 again, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. In our day-to-day -day lives, Monday through Saturday, we are tossed back and forth so much between these hectic schedules. And these schedules can include work, family, school, dinner, laundry, soccer practice, dance, all of this. So when we come here for corporate worship on a Sunday, we come for a little while seeking a reprieve from that. Through singing, prayer in the word. I know that when I come here on Sunday, I am looking to feel and to hear God more than I do to, during the week because life happens, distractions. But when we come here expectant, that's an important part. Come here on Sunday mornings expectant, expecting to hear him, to feel him. But when we come here, we can close out the world for a while and breathe God in. And people, it is that, that we fill up 
and we take back out with us. It is through concentrated worship here that God speaks to us. Worship in whatever form creates this intimate space between us and God, and he hears us. That furthers our relationship with him. It deepens our identity in him, and that is what fills us up. That is what we take back out into the world, and that is what sustains us through all those distractions that we walk through every week. When we are here in corporate worship, how amazing is it? I got to thinking about this. We're here in corporate worship. You're not just worshiping with the people in front of you, behind you, or beside you. People, we are worshiping with worshipers everywhere. And I started getting these chills thinking about it. If you think about that, we're really kind of in a dress rehearsal for eternity. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be on the sidelines in eternity. I want to be in the game. I want to be in it. So when you are here and you are worshiping, let this be where our kids see that in us. Let this be where your worship begins, where you breathe him in and you go back out in your week. My worship, your worship, our worship is not meant for the massives. It is not meant for the people around you, the person in front of you behind you. Our worship is a response to God for his many, many mercies. Francis Chan is a pastor and author. If you haven't read anything by him, leave immediately today and go get one of his books. They are fantastic. But he was overheard one time when they were leaving a service one Sunday. Somebody said to him, huh, I didn't really enjoy worship today. To which Francis Chan responded, that's okay, we weren't worshiping you. When I read that, I was like, whoa, you know? But what a fantastic reminder that we all have our preferences. We all have our preferences in styles of music, songs, even the way people pray in certain pastors. I, just, I like my husband, he's my favorite pastor. But uh, no offense, Jeremy. But you know, I mean, we all have our preferences, but people, we are here. We are gathered with worshipers everywhere to worship the same good, faithful, merciful, loving, and gracious God. So it doesn't matter our preferences. We are here to worship. When we worship, he heareth us, we hear him, and it is a beautiful thing. But worship isn't meant to be contained to just one or two hours on a Sunday. Worship is 24 seven and it is a lifestyle. I'm gonna recall again the scripture. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your true worship. When I finally, finally, what I feel like God thinks took forever, realized that raising my kids, giving them back to God was a form of worship for me, I began to grasp that worship was so much more than what we do on any given Sunday. Worship is a lifestyle. 1 Corinthians 10.31, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Eating, drinking, working, resting, raising our children are all to be done to the glory of God. In other words, every activity that we do should be done in a light of pleasing Him. Everything we do is supposed to flow out of a heart that loves God above everything else. When you help your neighbor, that's worship. When you go build a child a bed, that is worship. When you sit with a friend that needs a friend and a listening ear, that is worship. People, when you show up here on a Sunday, beat up from the week and tired and drained, but you show up, that is worship. 
We're told in 1 Samuel, men see the outside, but God sees our heart. God wants our true and authentic worship. He knows that you're here. He knows why you're here, and he knows that we need to hear him. We have a reciprocal relationship with God. He loves us beyond measure. He loves us like no other. We love him. We live for him. That is our worship. Coming here on a Sunday is a refueling, a concentrated, set-aside time to gather corporately and to worship him. But worship is not about me. It is not about you. It is not about the staff here at Clear Branch. It is not about the band. It is not about those beautiful little children that come over and sing for us. It is not about your small group, which I love my small group. If you don't have one, come see me. Do life with a small group. But people, it's not about that. Worship is about God. Worship is not always convenient or comfortable even. Sometimes worship is a sheer act of will. But friends, we are made to worship the one that gives us our salvation, the one whose mercies are new every morning. And I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful for that. The one that loves us immeasurably, the one that gives us endless, undeserved grace. As Jesus followers, how we serve, how we give, how we love, these are all expressions of our faith. So at the risk of looking foolish, let's go out of here today and live a lifestyle of worship. Let me tell you something, Micah has prayed back there over the band and he has prayed from right here on this stage. God, let us give it everything that we've got, even at the risk of looking foolish. So, you know what? Everything that we do should be done, like I said, out of a heart that loves God. Go out of here today, live a lifestyle of worship, let your God-infused life lead others to worship. Live your life so that your worship journey becomes your life habit. I mean, we are talking salvation, people. If God had not given me my kids, if God never does anything else for you, that alone deserves our worship. No matter what is going on in your life, no matter what is going on in this beautiful, but crazy world that we live in, God still sits on his throne and he deserves our worship. So go out of here today, considering your life a dress rehearsal for eternity. Because people, I'm telling you, we're gonna be doing this for eternity and I want you to go with me because I'm headed there, okay? So let's worship him, the one who is most assuredly deserving of it. <sighs> Consider your life, this dress rehearsal, and I pray, I pray that it brings about a joy in your worship. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you grow us in a habit of worship God, I pray that you see our entire lives as an opportunity to worship you. Let how we serve God, how we live and how we love be expressions of our faith. God, I pray here today that you would see a legacy of worship in every family, God, and I pray that you let it begin right here with us. All praise glory and honor be to you, good and gracious God. We love you. Amen.
It's my mom, y'all. <laughs>